The Politocrat is brought to you by the great people at Anchor. Anchor is such a great place to go if you want to get started in podcasting. And it's easy and it's free. Anchor. Marvelous stuff. Marvelous. And I'm so grateful to the folks at Anchor for getting me going with The Politocrat. If you want to get going and be heard on Apple, on Spotify and everywhere podcasts can be, Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Yeah, I did. Mr. Chairman, I just have one question for Dr. Fauci. Doctor, I wanted to ask you, in your testimony earlier in response to a question by Senator Murray, you outlined a basic concern you have with regard to states reopening. Can you restate that for us? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Casey. Yes. My concern is that if states or cities or regions, uh, their attempt, understandable, to get back to some form of normality, disregard to a greater or lesser degree the checkpoints that we put in our guidelines about when it is safe to proceed and pulling back on mitigation. Because I feel if that occurs, there is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control, which in fact, paradoxically, will set you back, not only leading to some suffering and death that could be avoided, but could even set you back on the road to trying to get economic recovery. Because it would almost turn the clock back rather than going forward. That is my major concern, Sen. That was Dr. Anthony Fauci testifying today before a Senate hearing on coronavirus, on reopening the country here in the United States and about the science. Dr. Fauci was speaking to Democratic Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. Welcome to... The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, May the 12th, 2020. The focus of this episode is health, is the coronavirus, and particularly in the last day or so where we've seen in several countries some shifts One way or another, we've seen Germany and South Korea, two of the most proactive countries, having to modify their reopenings and, in fact, close things back up again to a large degree because their opening was a little bit too hasty, too expansive, and there was a spike in the rates in both of those countries whom had been amongst the two countries in the whole world that had been very, very good at containing the spread of this virus. Their testing programs were excellent from the start. And the way that they have provided for their citizenry as well has been very good. Up until this point, where they've both now had to close things back up again. We see Denmark doing so very well. Their rate of death per million people is, I think, nine or ten, which I think is exceptionally good. Denmark has been amongst the leaders in the world in terms of quelling their rates. And actually, let me just correct myself. Nine people per 100,000 is the death rate, not one million. Nine people were per 100,000 in Denmark. 24 per 100,000 in the United States. And Denmark has been amongst the leaders in the world. We've also seen Sweden, their death rate 32 per 100,000. As Sweden now reevaluating its herd immunity strategy, which has absolutely been a disaster. There is a criminal probe underway in Sweden after 
it saw, surprise, surprise, a spike in the number of deaths in care homes where the elderly are. The elderly disproportionately hit by this virus, but also people of all ages are. And it cannot be overlooked. Sweden now are having, again, a criminal investigation into this. And quite frankly, Sweden should never have ever done this strategy of letting everybody just walk around in the population. I, I, it was just a horrible thing. The rates of death went way up. And now Stefan Löfven, the prime minister of Sweden, Stefan Löfven, and I've talked about him before in a previous episode, talked about Sweden before in a previous episode of this podcast, is now planning to spend the equivalent of 220 million US dollars, which I quite frankly don't think is enough to get more staffing to protect the most vulnerable, the elderly in the country of Sweden. 3,256 deaths from COVID-19 in Sweden as of yesterday. Sweden still has gyms open, schools open, restaurants and shops all throughout this pandemic. Sweden did not handle this the right way. Denmark did. New Zealand did. Germany did. South Korea did. All of them acting early. All of them testing early. All of them testing as many people as they possibly could early. Their healthcare systems meant that everybody was accounted for, did not have to pay a dime for the testing. And it was done in January of this year. There were lockdowns in Germany, well, at least for the most part in Germany, but there was never a lockdown done in in South Korea because what was counted on was social distancing. What was counted on was a very good testing infrastructure, a tracking and tracing infrastructure. And as a result, South Korea minimized the number of people who died from this virus. Now, there has been a spread because of the reopening and in a few nightclubs, apparently that's where the source of this respread has happened. But that's all been closed down again swiftly by South Korea. And what you're seeing is a very active and receptive government. So all of this is to say that while New Zealand and places like Denmark and places like South Korea and Germany... And a few others like Vietnam, which as of at least last late last month had not had a single death in their country. Here in the United States, we have this absurdity of reopening nearly every single state in the union. At least 48 states at last count have reopened. And here on this Tuesday, May the 12th, It is incomprehensible with what you heard from Dr. Fauci to begin this episode that the states would be reopening anything. There's never been a sacrifice, and I've argued this from the beginning, that we have never been asked, at least during the course of this pandemic, we have not generally been asked to sacrifice much of anything. Certainly Donald Trump did not talk about sacrificing anything. He didn't want anybody to get tested. He still discourages testing, even though he said two months ago that anybody who wanted a test could get a test. Of course, that is not true. So the lies, propaganda, disinformation, and gaslighting coming from the White House continues on. While today we actually got a decent Senate hearing where four of the officials from the Trump administration testified, one of whom was Dr. Anthony Fauci, who you heard there at the beginning. The others were CDC Director Robert Redfield, the FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn, and 
Admiral Brett Girard, and each of them were self-isolating in a 14-day quarantine out of an abundance of caution following the news over the weekend that several White House officials, including the press secretary to Vice President Mike Pence, tested positive for COVID-19, the coronavirus. So that is what we had today. And quite frankly, the Senate, I think, conducted themselves as well as they could. They were, of course, a couple of senators, Republicans, who felt the need to grandstand and inject partisan politics. But even most of the Republicans who were a part of the Senate committee in the hearing today exercised decorum and exercised a very, I think, decent approach to what is a very serious public health issue. I thought that Republican Senator Tim Scott out of South Carolina, I think particularly was good at his approach. He just laid out the statistics of his state, what his state, South Carolina, is doing, and also what things that they seek to do, prompting Tony Fauci to actually uh, applaud him for the model that he's setting. And I will play that audio coming up. But it was certainly, I think, a decent hearing conducted by Senator Lamar Alexander from his, basically his bunker, his, what looked like his basement what, in in, uh, in Alabama, or maybe he was, excuse me, he's from Tennessee, uh, or maybe he was, if he wasn't in Tennessee, maybe he was in D.C., at his D.C. home, but wherever he was, he was in a bunker somewhere. While, and so were many of the other senators who either stayed in their Senate offices or were home in their respective states at their homes or in their state offices. And they were all coming in through Zoom and they were all speaking out. You had Senator Elizabeth Warren, you had Senator Bernie Sanders, you had Rand Paul in the building itself, not wearing a mask and making things political. You had Senator Kelly Loeffler doing the same. She's the senator, as you may remember, who sold stock uh, upon information about this virus as did Richard Burr. He also was at the hearing, not wearing any mask, at least while he was speaking. And I didn't see that he had one. But most of the other senators on both sides of the aisle were wearing masks. And I think that the information that was presented at that hearing was very good. And it was all coming from Dr. Fauci, who remains the country's most important health official, or at least the most prominent one. There are others in a number of other states, and I've talked about Dr. Amy Acton from Ohio, from the Department of Health there, who I think has been absolutely excellent in her briefings and conveying very important information the public needs to know. And generally speaking, there are others as well. I think Dr. Barbara Ferrer down in Los Angeles has also done a very good job, as have numerous others that I can't bring to my mind at the moment. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think this Senate hearing today was of use and had less of the partisanship than I expected it to. President Trump would not allow Dr. Fauci to get anywhere good. I can't believe I mentioned the P word in front of the word Trump. But Trump did not allow Dr. Fauci to testify before the House, which I think is a disgrace. But Democrats certainly got to question him, got to ask him things, got to ask the other three officials things. And I think, again, Dr. Fauci was providing a very good reservoir of information for the general public. When I return... Another clip from the hearing, perhaps even two clips, and a word about California. We've set off the flat in the curve, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. We 
We need to do better and we will do better. My question, Dr. Fauci, is as we start the process of moving towards uh, reopening South Carolina, what else would you suggest that we could do to protect our most vulnerable populations? Thank you, Senator uh, Scott. Uh, you gave a really very eloquent uh, description of what I think is one of, would be a model way, the way you've approached this. I mean, you have put things in place that I think would optimize your capability of reopening. And I was, as I was thinking as you were speaking, I, I'd almost want to clone that and make sure other people hear about that and see what, what you've been doing. The issue of your direct question to me about the vulnerable populations is that, as we have said in our guidelines, and it looks like you are ready to progress carefully because you put into place a very good system, that the vulnerables, the elderly and those with underlying conditions, should be those who at the very last uh, uh, lifting of mitigations should be those who are left in a situation where they might be in danger of getting infected. In other words, protect them right up until the very end of the relaxation of your mitigation. Because as you said very correctly, those are the individuals that are the most vulnerable to the morbidity and the mortality. So those are individuals, particularly I might say, sir, those in the minority group, the African-American and Hispanics, who for a variety of, 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 of situations that are the social determinants of health, have a greater likelihood of not only getting infected, but of also having the underlying conditions that would make their risk for a high degree of morbidity and mortality higher. So it looks like you're doing things very, very well. And I would encourage you to continue and to follow the guidelines as you get closer to normalizing your state. Thank you. That was Dr. Anthony Fauci once again. And he was speaking to Republican Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina during today's Senate hearing on coronavirus and on reopening and on science, which is a hearing, by the way, that I thought was useful. I thought it was useful. I would have liked also to see all of these individuals, these four officials from the Trump administration appear before the Democrats in the House and the Republicans in the House. I would have like that to happen. It is not going to happen because of the partnership, the part, it's not partnership, the partisanship of Donald Trump, who has used this pandemic as a political football, which is despicable. Declaring mission accomplished when you have over 83,000 people dead from COVID-19 in the United States of America. We have only tested, according to the hearing, one of the fixed figures that came out, 9 million people in a country of 328 million. And yet, 48, 49, nearly, I guess, 50 states, they've all reopened in some way, shape or form in a partial manner. As was said in these clips by Dr. Fauci, you do not really want to reopen. It is a very risky proposition. And as you heard just then, Dr. Fauci praised Republican Senator Tim Scott for the judicious way that he and his state were going about things with this coronavirus where the most vulnerable populations, the elderly, black people, the Latinx community, were being hit the hardest. And I wonder if you think it is too soon to reopen these states. Do you think it's too soon to reopen? Given everything that we know, given the fact that Dr. Redfield himself, and interestingly, nobody asked him about this during this hearing, But it's something he said last month to the Washington Post and during one of Trump's campaign rallies. Was that the coronavirus was going to come back with a vengeance and likely very seriously and very severely 
much more severely likely to be more severely this fall here in the United States. Nobody asked him about that today. But I just don't understand why people, and I know obviously people want the economy to be somewhere better than it is. I think everybody does, but not at the price of death, not at the price of infecting their loved ones or their other family members or their partners, their spouses, their parents, their grandparents. And I am concerned that what's happening here in the United States is what is happening in the United Kingdom, is what has happened in Sweden. This herd immunity strategy of just letting this virus wash over the population and be done and accept the fact that we're going to lose people. Well, I don't accept the fact that 83,000 people are dead because it's probably three times that number. And I don't accept the fact that we should just say that there's 83,000 dead and not have some kind of feeling around that. I really believe that we should be talking more about the people who have lost their lives. And we should be talking more about preventing loss of life with smarter, wiser strategies when it comes to here in the U.S. or anywhere else, quite frankly. Consider this from the Los Angeles Times today. The headline, California still in danger zone as the death toll keeps climbing. Rong Gong Lin II, Iris Lee and Colleen Shalby have written that story in today's Los Angeles Times dated May the 12th. And here's just a piece of what was written. L.A. County beaches are expected to reopen with social distancing rules Wednesday, allowing surfing, swimming, running and walking, but banning biking, playing volleyball, sitting, sunbathing and picnicking. Parking lots, bike paths, piers and boardwalks will remain closed. Everyone will be required to wear masks and stay at least six feet away from others, officials said. But local officials in the hardest hit counties suggested that a broader reopening would be slow in Los Angeles and the Bay Area. Quote, it's safer to stay at home, Barbara Ferrer, the L.A. County Director of Public Health, said Monday. Quote, this is our new normal. It will go on for a while, end quote. With summer approaching, health officials on Monday urged the public to not take leisure trips, including weekend trips, while the pandemic continues. Quote, we are, in fact, asking people in our health officer order to avoid non-essential travel. And we would ask that our neighbors across the state and across the country do the same, Ferrer said. There's probably very few places in the world right now that would like to see travels into their community. Quote, it's best for people to limit their travel to essential travel, added Dr. Grant Colfax, San Francisco's director of public health. Quote, this is not the time to go on a trip for recreation or vacation, even to visit family and friends, end quote. Now listen to this portion of the article. There is no mandatory 14-day quarantine for visitors coming to California, as is the case in Hawaii, where violations are punishable by a $5,000 fine and one year in prison. But Ferrer requested that people coming to L.A. County, quote, do self-quarantine when you come in and you do keep yourself away from other people for that 14-day period. Now, 
And finally, these last few words that are very sobering from this story. On Sunday, an influential coronavirus forecast projected a worsening death toll by early August. The University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation now forecasts a California death toll of more than 6,000 people by early August, up from the forecast of 4,600 that was issued a week ago. By the way, California has almost 3,000 deaths at the moment. And we are in the middle of May. Back to the article. The state is among eight predicted to see the largest increases in projected cumulative deaths, according to a forecast issued May 4th and updated Sunday. This group also included Pennsylvania, Illinois, Arizona, Florida, Mississippi, Missouri, and Connecticut. By the way, and I'm going to step away from the article for a moment. Those states, many of those states that I just mentioned, have sizable rural populations. They have sizable elderly populations, especially places like Florida and Mississippi and Arizona. They have sizable black populations. And in the case of Arizona and Florida, have sizable Latino populations, Latinx populations. All of those groups I've mentioned are at very high risk for this virus. Back to the article. As a whole, the U.S. is now projected to record more than 137,000 deaths by early August, up from a forecast of 134,000 issued last week. The national death toll on Monday topped 80,600. Experts expect the number of fatalities to grow nationally. Quote, we're headed for potentially a very large outbreak in the fall which will make whatever we've seen pale in comparison. That quote from Dr. George Rutherford, a former epidemic intelligence service officer with the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. That's the CDC. California, he says, has not overcome the first wave of its cases. So why on earth are parts of this state reopening? Why on earth are parts of every state in the union pretty much reopening? There are 41 million people in California. We have tested less than 4% of them. There are only two cities that I can think of that have testing for pretty much everybody who wants a test now. San Francisco, which is saying that there is free testing and also that you just have to have believed that you've come into contact with the virus and have had a symptom. And they list symptoms from runny nose to stuffy nose to coughing to the other symptoms that have been listed as a connection, perhaps, to coronavirus. And in Los Angeles County, where anybody can get a test in the county, anybody at all, free of charge, regardless of whether you've uh, had the virus or not, rather, or whether you've had any symptoms or not. There are not too many other cities in California, and there's certainly not too many cities anywhere in America, in the U.S., where that kind of thing is going on. And yet we are opening up all these states. It is a very Hitlerian tactic, quite frankly. 
it falls into this horrible, horrible, psychopathic and anti-Semitic trope of work is liberty. That is what you are seeing in these protests from these vastly white, vastly male, vastly violent, arm-carrying guns, that is. Noose-carrying, swastika-waving, confederal battle flag and Trump flag-waving people who are invading these capital offices in various states, including in Michigan. That's what they're arguing for. Freedom is liberty. Work is liberty. That is the horrible thing that was etched in death camps, in work camps, in Auschwitz, in Dachau, in Pol- in everywhere in Poland. In the 1930s and 40s. I don't think that that's the model that we want to be representing here in the United States. But I am keenly aware that that is exactly what we are doing here in the United States. I think the madness has to end. The psychopathy and the sociopathic behavior of Donald Trump and of some of these Republican governors must end. You have a unique opportunity to vote these individuals out of office this November 3rd. 2020. I would register to vote at whenweallvote.org. I would register to vote if you could, if you wanted to, if you don't like that website, to go to rockthevote.org. If you are here in the United States, check to see if you are registered to vote. And if you don't want to try that website, you can also do a search engine search for the Secretary of State or Board of Elections in your city or in your county or in your state. Type in whichever state it might be, California, Texas, Louisiana, New York, New Hampshire, whichever state it might be, and then type in either Board of Elections or or Secretary of State to get your Board of Elections person or county or your Secretary of State for your state. And then from there, you can find the website and then register to vote or check your voter registration and keep checking it twice a month. Information is power. And so it's very important, especially in these times, that you keep your eye on voting. Keep your eye on it and make sure that you are ready to vote this November. California, speaking of California, has been sending and will be sending out or will be soon sending out ballots this coming for this coming general election in November. They will do that eventually. Send out ballots. Gavin Newsom, the governor here, become the first governor in the state to do that. So that no matter what happens, there will be guaranteed ballots for every single voter in this state. That's over 20 million people. Now, of course, we've got to make sure that the post office stays open and make sure that that gets fully funded, which means you've got to call Congress at 202-225-3121 and tell your senators and tell your congressperson that there must be an emphasis on funding the post office. Do not let this go. Demand legislation that funds the post office and keeps it solvent. By the way, one last thing about California before I sign off here. Gavin Newsom, the governor of this state, and I just read you a portion of that Los Angeles Times article talking about California being far from out of the woods, as are most states, also far from being out of the woods. And we are still all going through this 
virus. This is not something that has gone away. And I'm hoping that people, just because they see partial reopenings, I am hoping that people don't think that this is over. But that is the risk that you will get. And you already see people not wearing masks around here in San Francisco, for example, and elsewhere, and people in large clusters. But what I want to say about California is that just about two months ago, Gavin Newsom said that at least 55% of the state of California would come down with this virus, would be infected with this virus. Over 55% of the state's population, which is roughly 26 million people out of the 41 million in the state, give or take. So if it is true, eight weeks ago, according to the governor of the state, that over 26 or around 26 million people would be infected with coronavirus, why on earth are parts of California even opening? Someone has to provide an answer for that. Maybe the governor himself can do that. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.